seven years ago now, 2008, we started this piece of work by setting up some field trials, three sites, and we soil sampled to get baseline measurements. Um, and from then on, it has just grown. And, but we have had a lot of support along the way to make this happen. So if I, a lot of people, there's a few familiar faces here um, at, at today's event. So some of these slides are going over the basics, but I need to set the, set the framework for, um, for those that aren't so familiar. So we had three sites, one here, or one actually close here to the hall at Bookham at Kyora. We've got one at Bynalong at um, Glenroy, and another one down the Childala Road here on Takuti. Now, these three sites were all chosen, they're, they're native pasture sites with a bit of subclover through them, but they were all very low fertility sites. And we chose them for that reason, because we wanted to be able to have the opportunity to show the potential um, pasture productivity that may have come with, with increasing soil fertility by putting on product. So we have six years of data from two of these sites, um, Bookham here at Ky on Kyora and also at Glenroy. The, the last site, we had to call it quits after five years when DPI, big changes happened in DPI and we lost our technical support. So um, due to workload reasons, we've cut it back to two for that last year. Now we've had 11 treatments and three replicates at each site. That three reps is, a, is the key because this piece of work needed scientific rigour and that, that was why we actually went ahead and did a lot of this work was because there was very little science out there to back claims that were being made about um, various forms of fertiliser. We've, it's all been small plot work so you know I guess there's, there's always issues with small plot work, but I can assure you this, the numbers that we have now seen over six years, we've got a lot of consistency happening and I think it's a fair guide as to what is actually now happening. We haven't got grazing animals involved, it's all been handled with a, a lawnmower, but still I think the, the messages are in the ballpark of what you would see in the real world. <clears throat> so. This is the range of, um, get our pointer happening, this is the range of fertilisers that were, were tested. You can see we've got a range of mineral, both mineral sort of products, we've got liquid products, rock phosphates, some organic and sort of compost sort of type products, so manure is included in that, and some are more microbial based products. And sometimes the microbial products are added in with the solid products, the rock phosphates. So a real mix of what's out there. Those mixes were chosen by um, producers in this area when we first started the work. And they have basically been applied according to fertiliser company recommendations. So the companies were given the baseline sort of data right at the start and then each year they get a copy of the current soil test results for their plot. And they then get to make the call, do we want to put it out again? On, on their plot or don't we? So I think that's a very important point to have because you know it's it's then it's the company what the company's saying to 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 that should happen and that is how you see it as a farmer or a landholder you th this work really is set up exactly as you would experience in the real world. So all the comparisons we've had uh, basically have been made back to both single super as a more conventional treatment that's quite commonly used and also to a nil control treatment. So that just to run you through some of these products, in your handout there is a table, um, the second table in that, that outlines these products and the pattern of application because some products went out every year like single super, triomine, ecomin went out every year, so did the Wylad mineral blend. Um, and the, this Dical ecology mix went out every year, but others went out every second year. So things like Biowag was every second year. Um, so was our compost. We had then pig manure that was put out every third year. And the, um, 
The one that's gone out only once is Agri-Ash, which is a sewage ash product out of Canberra. Um, and, and the Wilad tea, of course, was a microbial culture and that was sprayed out every year. Now, urea was in the mix. I'm not so sure that we can make as much from that, that result now as time's gone on, but um, it was put out as a nitrogen source to compare against largely the pig manure. Okay, now to run you through just um, some of the, the processes that have gone on every year. So every autumn we give produce, uh, the, sorry, the companies the opportunity to say whether they want their product out. So that's when spreading happens, if it happens. Now this is back in um, year one. This was very much at the beginning and at the Glenroy site at, at Bynalong. And Rob Gorman, who now isn't working with DPI anymore, but Rob, Rob was spreading agri-ash and we had to put black plastic around because that stuff, if anyone knows what it's like, it's like powder. Um, and he wasn't allowed to travel in the car with us for the rest of the day to the other sites after that because he was a little on the nose. So um, he, he had his own vehicle. <laughs> He's not here to, to, vent, to, to defend himself. Um, we then, every year, have locked the, each of the, the three sites up. So we, we mow them all off, take, we actually remove the material at the lock-up point and, and bring them all back to being equal in, in height. And then we let it grow. So I'll move into the data that comes from that soon, but that, that process has happened every year, um, either in, a, a, an autumn, in the autumn or in the spring. It's varied um, over the time. We then, in spring, have made pasture quality measurements um, on every, every plot at every... Um, at every site, so we take random grab samples to be able to measure um, basically feed quality, so digestibility, energy and protein. Um, and, you know, to be able to tell you, okay, in terms of, we've got some figures today that Phil Graham will deliver on livestock production. You know, what, what does that mean in terms of, of the animal? So what treatments are performing better than others? We then, in spring every year, go and, and mow a strip down this, not always the centre, but always in the same part of the plot, um, down, right down, the, down through the, the plot to take a dry matter measurement. And that dry matter measurement is, is then we, we take grab sample or samples that we dry so we can work out a dry matter percentage. And we've measured the area of each plot, that we've ha the bit we've harvested, so we can then convert it to a kilograms of dry matter per hectare that's, that's been take, excuse me, taken off every plot. And then come basically late spring, that's the time when we, we go in and we will soil test, but we always, always soil test on moisture, so that we're soil testing to 10 centimetres, and that's, that's the depth that we've, we've done each year at that time of year. Um, so that it's very consistent over time in, in our sampling procedure. <coughs> Rightio, so moving into some of the data. So this, this information is all in that handout, um, so you don't sort of have to be madly scribbling with lots of notes, but basically the, what I'm trying to show you here is at each site, I'm only presenting you the Glenroy and the Kyora data, so Bynalong and, and one of the Bookham sites, because the Takuti, we, we're still, the analysis is still happening on the Takuti um, site, unfortunately. So most of the information in this whole presentation now will be on those Glenroy and Kyora sites. So this is now presenting you at Glenroy 2009 through to 2014 the herbage mass that was taken from that site. Now, it's colour-coded with years, so every, every colour here actually is from 2009 through to 2014. And we're, we're measuring on this y-axis the dry matter percent above the control. <clears throat> so, if there is an asterisk above that bar, 
when we put the statistical analysis over the data, if it was significantly different to the control, then it actually earned a, an asterisk on, on top. So you can see the products that have, over the years, you know, come good with, with being growing significantly more grass than the control are the ones that I'm, I'm circling now. So there is, there is some products there that are certainly growing, they're working. We put the Kyora data up and it's a similar story. The same order down the bottom, the same axes here, and we're getting the same sort of products that are growing. Now the thing I just, you might be wondering why are the pink bars, the light and the dark, higher, much higher than, than the first four? The reason there is we, the first four years we locked up in August. We locked that mowed it all off and let it grow for about nine, between nine and 12 weeks. And, and that was the sort of response we were getting in that first four years. But in the last two years, 13 and 14, we had producers asking at our field days, what happens in winter? Do these products still perform in the same way in winter? So we started locking up in May, in mid-May, and taking it through. Now the, the way we do a, a winter measurement actually was a different technique to the mowing technique. So our mowing, when we eventually did go in and mow, mow it was actually a, a summation of sort of 20 to 22 weeks of growth in the end. That, that's, that's how we had to handle it. So these two bars are bigger because they've had a much longer time, 20 to 22 weeks, to pull apart differences from the control. That's why we're seeing that, that bigger more growth. There were, there were more differences and more growth. And generally this Kyora site actually grew more pasture than the Glenroy site. It was a more productive site. Okay, now you might ask about the economics. So it's all well and good to know what works, but um, what, what things were more cost effective? And Many people that have been to my field days have seen this and probably think, oh, here's the same numbers again. Well, I've actually updated the numbers. They're 2014 now, not 13 or 12. <laughs> and um, don't take too much notice of the numbers, but telling you the process that I worked out every year a product cost for that product, even though it might not have been put out, I've worked out what it would have cost to buy it that year what the, and what it cost to land it at, at Yass. We, we had to choose a spot and then an, applic uh, an application or spreading cost had to be included. Um, and then we get a total cost down here. Now, because products aren't all put out evenly, I've then divided it by the frequency it was put out. So we come back to an annualised figure so we can start comparing apples with apples. But the things for you to remember or note on this sort of data are, one, again, is this freight charge issue, that it will vary depending how close you are to a source of the fertiliser. And two, note this very large difference in, in spreading costs. So we're going you know, um, from in the order of 53 down to $6.50 in price. So hence why spreading costs has to be included in costing these products. Okay, so I then went ahead and did that for every year, from 09 right through to 14 for every product and have averaged for, to, to get the six year average, that's the figure there. Now, the next, this, this table also is in your, your handout. Now, this, this data, this costings has allowed us to now move in to this cost effectiveness story. And I'm talking 2012, looking at the, the pasture growth that happened in 2012 and also the pasture growth that happened last year, 2014, and I'm putting the economics for 2012 based on the first, an average of the first four years of, of the costs. Okay, so the cost that goes with that is over the first four years, the cost that goes with the 2014 is over the six year period. Now, this is the Glenroy site and what I want you to look at here is, first of all, we've, the title is the cost of additional pasture grown above the control. So any product that didn't grow more than the control actually didn't make it to this graph. It's not there. 
But if it did grow, if it had an asterisk above that bar, then it is on this graph for those two years. And, and the, the y-axis is cents per kilogram of dry matter per hectare. So the smaller the number, the better. And the colours for the products, I've kept the colours consistent, so single soup is always green, pigs always orange, agri-ash is this black, a bioag's red, wildland mineral blend is, is the blue, and then the psychology dical mix is in the um, green, dark green. So what I want you to do, I've put these black lines across from the control because, uh, sorry, the, from single super, Single super just happened in, in, in just about every occasion to be very, if it wasn't right at the front, it wasn't very far behind, but it was usually at, it was the lowest bar. So I've drawn a line for you to be able to start looking at the differences above the control. That's what I want you to be homing your eye in, the difference above that black line. Now some of the trends you will see are things like bioag, um, it's on the next graph, the, the ecology appeared, it didn't actually appear in 2012 and nor did the Wilad Mineral Blend, but some of these, pro those three products are actually products that contain very, nutrients that, that release very slowly. And you would assume that a product like that will work better and better over time. The longer they have to be in the soil, the better they'll work. So you can see, for instance, BioAg has actually become more cost effective as time went on, from 12 to 14, that's been the shift. Agri-ash, on the other hand, it's a product, um, it's got a lot of slow release sort of P in it, but it's got a, a fair whack of very soluble phosphorus in it as well, sol soluble nutrients that, that you, we saw a lot of growth um, quite early in that, that site, that, that product, but at this particular site, it was a bit drier than, than the Kyora, not as productive this site, and this agri-ash has actually got more cost effective over time at this site because it has been a drier site, didn't grow as much, there's been more nutrient there to feed it over time, and it's slow rele released slowly. Pig, on the other hand, it's put out once every three years, so it, it gets, the, you know, it's, it's quite cost effective early on, but you can see two years later, after the nutrients are starting to, to drop, you start to see it to become less, less cost effective. We move to Kyora, and it's a similar story. Everything's the same, same colours. We're getting a few other things occur in the graph, but you, you can see, here's BioAg, more cost effective as we go, as we cut in 2014, fairly close to, to single super. Um, and then the, the ecology dical, it's actually the dical 64 that I think has given us the biggest effect the, in this treatment because it's a, it's a slow release sort of granular product. The ecology was a liquid product. It didn't seem to do too much in the first two years that it was put out, but dical was put out in the last four. And, but you can see over time, it's become more cost effective. Um, and the same with even and with the YLAD, you know, it, it was in this order here, it's actually dropped back to 10 here. And the pig, same story. Um, it's fairly cost effective, same story as before. I mean, it, it's effective in the year that it was put out and come two years later, it becomes less cost effective. The difference with the agri-ash, I think here, is this site grew so much more grass generally than, than the Glenroy site that we saw agri-ash actually become less cost effective at this site over time because we grew a hell of a lot early on at this site because it, it, it's quite a wet site. We were getting, I think, more release of nutrients, etc. cetera. Um, and it's, it's pretty much by 14 that, that product was exhausted at that site. Okay, so again, a slide you've probably seen a little bit of, but a pretty important slide. And it's, it's the piece of information that I suppose highlights this importance of, of um, soil phosphorus. It was work conducted by Richard Simpson at CSIRO, and 
it was taken, soil was taken from the Kyora trial site, was not limed, it was just um, as is, and then put into pots and ryegrass was grown. But in these pots, all nutrients were put into this pot to satisfy maximum growth. All these other plots, pots, every nutrient bar one was put in. And you can see the bar, the, the nutrients that were left out are at the top. So, you know, lo and behold, the thing that's holding things back the most at this site where we're seeing is phosphorus. Now that's, it's not really only at this site, it's quite a common finding that, that that's the trend at, at many sites in our tableland areas. Let's move into a bit more information now on phosphorus. It is present in fertilisers in different forms and it's a pretty, it, it's a very important fact to start understanding this data. We've got very water soluble forms which they're basically plant available forms of phosphorus. They're put on and they're available. So things like single super has a lot of it in it, but there are other products that have it in it too. So it's not the only one. There's things like in our trial, <coughs> things like um, agri ash, the pig manure did feed quite a bit of, of soluble P, water soluble P in. We've got um, citrate soluble P. So in that, again, another category that is, is fairly plant available quite quickly, so weeks to months. We then have a category that occurs that's a, a very insoluble form of phosphorus. It's measured using the citrate, um, well, the citrate method, but it's a citrate insoluble phosphorus and it's available to plants over years. It doesn't, it, it doesn't happen quickly. So it, it requires moisture, acid soils, warmth, temper temperature has a play to help break that down. That's how it's released over time. And then we have organic phosphorus, which is phosphorus that, that occurs in things like composts and manures. You know, it's very slow, it, it's, it's got to be broken down before it's released. But we do, in, when you put on a manure or a compost, there is also some levels of these quite soluble forms in them. So there's a mix and you'll, you'll see in a moment. So I've, I've actually graphed up now or, or tab, tab, put into a table all these products we actually had tested. Each year we, we had these products tested ourselves. And we, we tested them for water soluble phosphorus, citrate soluble, Inso I've called it insoluble, not just citrate insoluble because the organic P is, is other sort of categories, but it's insoluble phosphorus, what's the total, and also sulphur. Now anything that I have highlighted in, in orange or brownie orange, they're the products that actually delivered significant amounts of phosphorus and sulphur. So, so we've got single super, Agri-ash, the pig manure, Wild Mineral Blend, and Bioag, and then this, it's largely this Dicale 64, that this mineral component, not the liquid. And if you look at, if we look at the breakdown, I've now highlighted in green the products, where, where the P lies in these products. So in single super, it largely lies in this very soluble form of P. Don't home in on the numbers so much, but, but the fact of where the P is. Agri-ash, we've got a mix. Some of it sits in the soluble form, but, but it, a hell of a lot does fit in this insoluble. You can see the pig, it's a pretty much half-half ratio of so soluble to insoluble. Then the rest of these products, Wilad, Bioag and the Di Dical 64, they all are largely insoluble phosphorus products. The thing to note also is that sulphur, we've got single super and Wilad's product at Kyora. They're the two that actually delivered, you know, fairly high rates of, of sulphur. Um, the rest of them were, were quite a bit lower and but all of sort of similar order. So they're, they're, that's, that's the data. Now that table is also not colour coded, but it is in your, your handout. 
All right, so we'll move on now to the soil test data for phosphorus. And this is again Glenroy at the top, Kyora at the bottom. Colour coded with years. So this time we've got red in there. The red is actually year one. It was our baseline measurement back in 2008 from that plot. So before any product went out. And the same at, at Kyora. Now, on, on our y-axis, we have available phosphorus measured using the Colwell extraction method. And it's, it's the same scale at both, both sites. And if, if there is an asterisk above any of those bars, it means that there was a significant difference from the control in that, that year. OK, so firstly, home in on, on look at the control. Because you start to see there's some variation, isn't there? The numbers, the bars go up and down. That you don't see that, that number stay at the same level. So that tells us, I mean, that happens with seasonal variation. You, you, that, that's a natural occurrence. But that is why you've got to put stats over this sort of data. Because you, in order to pull out differences, you've got to account for that season, seasonal variation. So I've now put boxes around the products that actually started to show some, some significant differences happening to the, to the control. OK, so first of all, single super. You know at Glenroy, we got you know, a run of four years there at the end where it started to show it was building P significantly. Whereas at Kyora, we've only shown we've built P significantly in our last year. Now, the, the, the obvious thing to me that comes to mind is that site just didn't grow the amount of pasture that Kyora did. And we put the same amount of product on at both sites, but at this site, the lack of, we didn't grow the pasture, so it stayed in the soil. We have built phosphorus at, at Kyora, at, at, sorry, at Glenroy, at Bynalong. But at Kyora, we grew a hell of, regularly a lot of pasture each year. And, you know, we have only, pretty much been keeping pace with what was grown. And it was only in that last year that we found one, one, one point where we're starting to get a sign we might have been building. So that makes sense to me. The, the agri-ash, you can see our run of, we've got um, five bars there and we've got four, five bars here as well for agri-ash, building, building phosphorus. So it's a product went out once in year one in a big dose, two and a half tonne to the hectare, and you can see the point, I think the difference here is that Agriash actually built more on Kyora than it did on Glenroy. And, you know, a possible explanation for that is that that had a lot of citrate insoluble phosphorus in it. That site is a wetter, a wetter site, it is a touch more acid than the Glenroy site. And we know we need those conditions to break down soluble, insoluble P. So I'm not so surprised that that might have occurred at that site. It, it's actually peaked in that 2012 year, but it's dropped off after. Um, but it's, that would help, I think that's one possible answer why we're seeing it more so than at, than at Glenroy. That is a less acid, drier site that we just didn't break the same amounts of phosphorus down. Then we see pig manure. It's, it's a product, again, highly significant at, in all years. And you can see the pattern of increase happens in the year. The year you put it out, it goes up, and then it slowly drops. Put it out again in 2012, and then it drops. So, you know, you get that that pattern makes sense. Again, I think we possibly have built it a little bit more at Glenroy, a little higher there than Kyora, and that that is in line with it being a drier site. We just didn't grow as much, and more of it built at that site. There's still more in the soil. Um, and then the other the other two, I'll put these two products together. But bioag and ecology had significance in that last year. 2014 at Kyora and just Dical at, at Glenroy, you might have expected that they, those two products being very slow release, high citrate insoluble P in them, that might have 
you know, been releasing quite a lot more like agri-ash at Kyora because it's wetter, it's a little bit more acid, more, more potential for more solubility at that site, but it hasn't happened. It, it, we've only got significance in one year there. That tells us there's some other things coming into play there and factors that are, you know, that might be removing, um, you know, that there has been insufficient phosphorus, I guess, put on to compensate for, for other things like growth that remove P, like growth, you know, accumulation of P in the soil, any product that we took off, you know, so possibly not enough has been put on in these, these products to actually meet, meet the requirements. Now we move on to the sulphur data and again the way I've presented this data is, is in the same format. So 08 baseline moving right through to 14 and so this is measured using a KCL40 test and this is the axes of available sulphur here. Now note again how much variation you get from year to year in sulphur, just that's on the do nothing, just when it, just let to grow. So you've got to account for that and that's why we've done the stats yet again. And when you put the statistical analysis over it, you can see things like single, agri-ash and YLAD at, actually at, at um, Glenroy, they're the products that have given us some significance. Now, they're also the products that had S in them, like had more, probably a little bit more S, S in them. Um, and so my point, I guess, to you is here we go, we go, start with single, we see a run of five years in a row where we got significant building of S. Whereas at Kyora, we only got two years that built, built sulphur. Well, again, that, that would be a lot to do with the fact that site at Glenroy just didn't grow as much grass. It, it was a, a less productive site, so we built more P, I'm sorry, more S for we, same, same amount of products going on, but we, um, we built S. At, at ag, the Agri-Ash, we've got one bar happening at Kyora, two bars at, at Glenroy. Again, you know, it's the fact that site just didn't grow as much. So, so it's still accumulating. But Kyora is a wetter site and S is a very mobile nutrient in the soil. And, you know, I, I think that saturation at that site for, for periods of the year have probably also resulted in a bit more leaching of sulphur, but that site grew more. So, so you're actually using more S. So that's why I don't think we're seeing the, the levels of significance in these products down there compared to here. And the same for YLAD, you know, that's, that's been, it, it, it grew, um, didn't grow as much here and, and certainly as it had a bit of S in, it, in that product, so it, it's accumulated. All right, so we'll move on to, to um, this graph isn't in your handout, but it's basically a summation of over a six year period for these two sites, I've averaged the, harvey, the herbage that we harvested, you know, the amount. I've averaged those figures over six years. And I've, I've basically graphed it versus phosphorus and sulphur. So on this axis here, on the y axis, we've got the average dry matter percent above the control over that six year period. And down the bottom, I have ordered the products, they're not in the same order as those other soil graphs, they've been ordered with the products containing the highest amount of P, phosphorus, through to the lowest amount of phosphorus. And I've put the numbers for the phosphorus for each product above the top data points to give you an idea. So after six years, pig manure actually had delivered 177 kilograms per hectare of P. Agri-ash was 165, Bioag was 72, same with Dicale, 64, Single Super, 66, Wilad, Mineral Blend, 49, and so on. So, and under it I've put the S levels. But, you know, the main message is that the products that have grown the most 
have been the ones that had the highest amount of phosphorus. So, so that goes very nicely in line with, with you know, previous research work that says this is, phosphorus is a key driver of, of pasture growth. Now you'll note the difference in the lines. Single super, as I, uh, sorry, Kyora is, is actually a, a wetter site. It was a little bit more productive pasture, I suspect. And, and that I think explains why we're seeing this difference between the line basically all the way along. Um, so th the other point to highlight, you see this spike in single super. It's, it's produced the highest growth for, at both sites. Well, it's not surprising in that, okay, it's less phosphorus than the others, but it is a water soluble, largely water soluble or citrate soluble P. So you expect, you get quick growth when you put out those, that sort of form of phosphorus. Um, so that, that does make sense. So moving on, I think when you, when you look at it, put all that together, some of the thoughts and questions I think that we're left with are when you start with a low soil fertility status like we have on all these sites, you know, it brings the question to mind, can you, can you afford to wait for a pasture growth response when, when products, when, you know, when you're using products that largely consist of this insoluble phosphorus? And I really think that does come back to you individually. So it's either a business decision for you or it's a philosophical decision. And I, I know the phil philosophical decision is, is a big one for some people. And, you know, I think it really, you put it back in your court that, that the data speaks for itself, the data's there, but it is, it is really your decision which line you take or, or both. You might have a, a foot in both of those, those categories. Um, the other thing that I think we should note here is that sulphur has been particularly holding things back. The numbers are pretty low for sulphur for a lot of those products and it's holding growth back in, in a range of those products. So it's likely that if we put additional S out, sulphur out, then we would improve some growth in some of those, those treatments. But you know, recognising that that certainly would be adding to the cost. So, you know, that, that's something to, to think about. And so that's moving, that's sort of categorising or summarising that data to this point. The other thing that when Bynalong Land Care and farmers in this region decided to kick this work off, one of their key questions was, what's happening to the soil microbes? And so we, we set in place a protocol where we sampled, the, when we did our soil sampling in the spring, we kept soil, soils on ice, they were treated like, like royalty <laughs> and, and until they got to the lab uh, up in um, Lismore, and, sorry, at Wallingbar. We had them done through DPI lab. And we tested two things. We tested, one was this fluorescent diacetate activity test, and that is actually telling you whether the microbes are active or not. So they're point in time tests, they don't, it, it's just for now, at that point in time, was that more active than the control basically. And the other was this biomass carbon test. And the biomass carbon test is a test that is a weight of the microbes in the soil. So it's, it's, it's quite complementary to that activity test. It's, it's one tell, tells you, are they active? Doesn't tell you how many there are, but it tells you are, of the ones that are there, are they active? And the other is a carbon test that tells you the amount, it's a weight of, of carbon associated with microbes. Now the work over six years, we have had this, the three trial sites analysed. And, um, and I, I actually, even though I haven't got Takuti data for other, the other stuff, I've, I've got it for this. And I can now say to you that, that no product really has consistently resulted in any, any higher or lower figure in soil microbes um, compared to the control. So it's, it's um, yeah, to, that, to date that's, that's where we sit with the microbial story. And that's six years of data. So probably leaves you to the question, you know, are we calling it quits? And I think after today's effort we're, we're thinking we might have a little rest. <laughs> but um, we, um, 
we are going to, to continue on with this work in, a, in another sort of angle, I guess. So to date we've got six years of pasture and soil data that, that will actually be put into a final report by the end of this year and we'll have all your names and details, it'll go out to you at the end of this year. Um, we've currently, um, I've got some help, Jacinda Christie is um, helping me with this along with Bev Orchard who's our biometrician at Wagga. We're still analysing the botanical composition data for the six years of, of work and we will be measuring spring herbage mass this year, so coming up in another couple of weeks and also next year, even though we've not put product out, we're going to measure rundown rates of products because there's things out there that are slow release products as you can see and they need time to work and we want to see what sort of measurements we're, we're pulling out of some of that, those products. And then the other, the last thing which is I guess another angle to this, this whole trial that we've, we've tried to now move in another direction is this soil microbial stuff. And with the help of Alan Richardson who's here today and will be speaking to you, we are, we're going to be measuring soil, or we're in, I've already started, we, we've made it inroads, but microbial diversity and functionality testing, which will be determined on that soil that we collected last year in spring um, on the two Kyora and Glenroy sites. So that, you know, watch this space, I guess, for the next two years. We, um, I can't see the work really being pulled together for another, at least another 18 months or so. So we will um, report on that as it unfolds. And yeah, we, um, thanks to Jim, he's mentioned a few of our sponsors for today's event, but we've had a lot of people throw money at this, this work for us. Um, all the logos are there. And also, um, special thanks, I think, go to Bruce, who's second row in my audience. Thanks for coming, Bruce. <laughs> He's been a great supporter. Um, so Bruce Hazel and Nolan's in the catering, and um, Gary and Hansi Armour are on the Dakuti site, and Jeff Henderson, who's also in the audience, and Fiona Henderson at Glenroy, Bynalong. So, yeah, leave it at that. Thank you.